dissolved and then the inauguration of the seventh parliament ahead of the inauguration of President-elect Senator Dankwa Ekufuado. The Chief Justice has taken her seat and there he comes, Professor Michael Quay, in his beautiful kente cloth. Oh, that's He's not him. Suit. He's in a suit. <laughs> He's in a suit right there. Okay, okay, and then he will take his steps slowly. Oh, that man in the kente actually that, looks that, like him. His yes. head <laughs> looks like him from afar. Okay, so that is Professor Michael Quay there, the soon-to-be Speaker of Parliament. We've heard about his uh great credentials you know all the things that he has done the schools that he's been through and all of that all in a in a bit to make the point that he is qualified for this post and he is the right man he is the right choice okay let's listen to him now the clerk of parliament congratulations mr speaker elect may i now respectfully invite her ladyship, the Chief Justice to administer the oath of allegiance and the Speaker's oath. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance. And allegiance. To the Republic of Ghana. To the Republic of Ghana. As by law established. As by law established. That I will uphold. That I will uphold. The sovereignty, the sovereignty and integrity of Ghana. And integrity of Ghana. And that I will preserve. And that I will preserve. Protect. Protect. And defend the constitution of the Republic of Ghana. The constitution of the Republic of Ghana. <laughs> And allegiance to the Republic of Ghana. To the Republic of Ghana. As by law established. As by law established. That I will uphold. That I will uphold the integrity. The integrity of the Republic of Ghana. Of the Republic of Ghana. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully and conscientiously. And conscientiously discharge my duties. Discharge my duties as Speaker of Parliament. As Speaker of Parliament, and that I will uphold. And that I will uphold. Preserve. Preserve. Protect. Protect. And defend. And defend the Constitution. The of Constitution. The Republic of Ghana. Of the Republic of Ghana. And that I will. 
and that I will do right to all manner of persons, do right to all manner of persons in accordance with the Constitution of Ghana, in accordance with the Constitution and of Ghana, the laws, and the laws and conventions, and conventions of Parliament, of Parliament without fear, without fear or favor, or favor, affection, affection or ill will, or ill will. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> And they will append a few signatures there. And as I said earlier on, the Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, has just been ushered into the office um, by the Chief Justice, Madam Theodora, uh, Georgina Theodora Root, there. And he will append his signatures. And the whole of Parliament is anticipating. As we heard, Professor Michael Quay was born on the 4th of April, 1944. His father, E.J.N. Okwe of Osu Akwa, a cocoa merchant, and, and of course, um, his mother, Mrs. Felicia Ewusiki Okwe uh, from Odumase Krobo. He's, got, he's a third of seven children brought up at Asamankes in the eastern region. He attended the Catholic and Presbyterian schools before proceed, uh, proceeding to Presec, um, Odumase Kobo, where he did his O-level, and then a Pump Secondary School, where he did his A-level. At this moment, he's being decorated with a gown, the gown for the Speaker of Parliament. And very soon, he'll be ready and all set for business of Parliament. Professor Michael Quay also went to the University of Ghana, University of London, and Lincoln's in London. He holds a BA Honours in Political Science, LLB Honours, BL, and PhD degrees. His working life, of course, has mainly been a combination of private legal practice, and he has been lecturing in political science, doing active politics, and of course, as a pastor. He is a... Okay, at this moment... We'll expect to hear so, from um, Ghana's next Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay. So now we have a new speak. So now the speaker, we now have a speaker for the seven parliaments of the Ghana. The next stage is for the maze to be put up in an upright position. What it means is that the house now is in a formalized setting. Business is now in place. So as you can see, the marshal of parliament is now putting the maze in an upright position, signaling the formal setting of Parliament of the Republic of Ghana, uh, presided over by the uh, Speaker, Professor Aaron Mike Ope, okay, right Honorable Speaker, Professor Aaron Mike Ope. Okay. So the House now with the maze in an upright position tells you that we now have a formalized sitting of Parliament and the House is now in full session. Uh, the Speaker at this stage will now move on to deliver his acceptance speech and will tell us uh, possibly his vision for the next four years, uh, as he presides over the speaker, we can all listen. 
my laws, spiritual and temporal, honorable members of parliament elect, your excellencies, Nananu, Nime, Name, political parties, representatives, press corps, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. In the first place, I thank the almighty God for the great favor he has reposed in me. I thank the entire leadership of my party, including the president-elect, the vice president-elect, and the MPs, as well as the entire membership of this house for their support. I also have to thank the clerk of parliament for guiding the house up to this time. His priceless guidance will be valued in the future. I must thank my wife for her support in all my various activities, even up to this moment. It's a great honor to be nominated and elected as Speaker of this Honorable House. I see my presence here as a homecoming, albeit with a greater responsibility. I'm grateful to all who reposed resounding trust in me to make this possible. I pray to the Almighty God that I shall successfully travel the path pursued by many speakers, begun by the legal numbering, the Right Honorable Sir Charles Emmanuel Christ, also from my hometown, Busu, Accra. I wish to congratulate all of you, honorable members, for winning your seats. It is a unique opportunity to serve our new nation. I look forward to maximizing the opportunities for every member to contribute to the proceedings of this house. I trust the experienced ones will mentor the upcoming. Those who sit in front should please learn to look behind them to allow others to contribute. And remember that whereas they cannot normally see from the back of their heads, I have been placed on this platform so that everyone can catch my eye. I intend to be fair to all and therefore seek your understanding in advance. I encourage new entrants to prepare and present statements on any issue of interest. Apply the question time well your brilliant visibility will affect your re-election. I will meet with leadership on this and seek support of leading think tanks in Ghana to help you to deliver. A comprehensive mentoring process is vital for improved performance. I need to remind the new MPs that the highly procedural nature of parliament calls for an equally high level of commitment the rules and procedures of the institution. Serious learning will therefore have to be undertaken to sharpen your competences in order to perform optimally. To the majority, let me remind you that we have a two-party parliamentary system heavily dominated by you, so far as this particular session is concerned. There is, however, the need to be guided by high ethical considerations so that we do not relapse into ultra-majoritarianism, a symptom of the tyranny of the majority. We will encourage healthy debates. To the minority, even though most parliamentary business is organized on this majoritarian principle, the time-honored rights of minority to open, frank, fair, and honest debates so as to make your case and offer constructive alternatives will be respected under my stewardship. Both the majority and the minority must be guided, and I'm sure will be, by the mandate given to the, gov to the government and parliament to build a vibrant society anchored on the principles of fairness and equality of opportunities. The promotion of good governance requires a parliament that can effectively perform the three cardinal functions of representation, oversight, regarding the executive, and lawmaking. 
our ability to control public expenditure will be good service to our people. Ghanaians everywhere are looking out to Parliament and government for the solutions to the problems that confront them on a daily basis. It cannot be business as usual. Our people expect us to help fix the economy, provide jobs for the unemployed, improve access and quality of education, health care, and generally give them hope for the future. This parliament is for the people of Ghana, and they want us to be honest, accountable, and responsive to their needs. I ask for cooperation from all and sundry to make our stewardship a shining example. Challenges. The Fourth Republic Parliament has been seeking to re-establish its role as a key public institution. The challenges have been media. During the dark days after independence, any time a coup occurred, Parliament was dissolved, while the executive continued, even, even if in a different shape. This instability has affected the development of Parliament. When Parliament reconvened in 1993, after several years of military rule, for example, only one member had been a member of Parliament before. Hence, institutional memory was negligible. Strides have since been made, and we congratulate all those who have helped the process of restoration of the ideals, beliefs, and values of parliamentary democracy in Ghana. Nevertheless, a huge task still remains ahead of us, and I trust that we shall rise to the occasion. Standing on it. Parliament operates by rules and procedures while the standing orders. Incidentally, in Parliament itself, it is generally agreed that there is the need to revise the rules as a whole. Committees have been set up to revise the, these rules, but for a decade, for over a decade, this process had stalled. Sometimes proceedings become jerky in the House, as leaders and members recall conflicting experiences from memory. I am committed to completing this lingering exercise and I will seek the cooperation of this present leadership, whom I respect so much. In this connection, there is another issue to tackle. Rulings of speakers in the past will be captured to serve as guidance and precedence for smooth operation of the House in the future. The Indian example is thoroughly published together as rulings from the chair. I will make copies of the full series available to leadership so that we should have Ghanaian precedents well recorded for posterity. This is how institutions grow scientifically, systematically, and with responsibility. <laughs> private members' bills. The controversy relating to private members' bills should be resolved. It is tragic that currently it appears to us that members of parliament cannot initiate legislation independent of the executive. We are all aware of Article 108 of the Constitution. It provides that once a bill has financial implications, it can only be introduced by the executive. The narrow view of financial implications must end. This narrow view has taken the position that every bill has financial implications, including the paper on which it is printed, and the clerks who work on it, who are also paid by government. Hence, only governments can initiate legislation. This should change. We learned the practice from the UK Parliament. The principle was that the Commons will not give to the King or the Queen money that the Crown had not asked for. But over the years, even the very British and in their parliament have developed means of allowing private members to introduce legislation. Recent studies are made show that there are a number of procedures whereby private members may initiate bills. Certainly, the executive cannot sit aside while members alone pass laws which impose obligations which the executive cannot meet. 
we shall broaden our horizons in the lawmaking process to benefit our people. If a private member, if a private member's bill seeks to make a law that will tighten the stranglehold on corruption, how can that per se be a charge on public purse? How will a law that protects our women, children, and persons with disability per se be a charge on public funds? I do not see how laws which protect our environment, improve upon our tax collection, be inimical to the public purse. Indeed, if Parliament should introduce a law which will enhance the collection of revenue by the revenue authorities, we shall be contributing to the public purse, not be a liability regarding say. The introduction of private members' bills will release the best of the innermost capabilities of honorable members, broaden the horizons of the members, and gain the respect of the Ghanaian populace. Honorable members, I challenge you respectfully to help improve our laws on elections. We have a lot to learn from others, including Kenya, who learned the hard way after brutal post-election civil war. To sanitize the system, they enacted the Electoral Offenses Act. You only have to read it and be inspired. We should copy this and improve upon it. Let me give you a few examples. Why should our law allow any two adults who are registered to vote to stand in for a person whose age or nationality he cannot really vouch for? Why should just two, any two people be allowed to do this? If you do not stand in local parentheses, how do you tell the age of a person you hardly know? We shall, we shall define only a small category of persons who can give guarantees. These should swear to an affidavit, verify the truth, and be jailed for five years or so if caught with the falsehood. These are matters that will bring sanity into the electoral system, no matter which political parties are the players. Our committee system, I'm sure you will agree, need a lot of sharpening and improvement in order to meet the challenges of the times. Matters of boycotts and walkouts have kept a lot of us at bay in many areas. We need to have a great look. Record keeping. Our library, record keeping process, and related activities need modernization. Parliament does today does not keep any record whatsoever of how individuals vote. This is in sharp contrast with the United States system and other jurisdictions which have detailed records of all Senate voting. President Obama's voting record became an issue and an asset in his victory. Both President-elect Nana Akufuado and President Muhammad, though very successful former MPs, had no such record to show in their presidential, presidential bid of both 2012 and 2016. It will have been interesting and most useful to have such record. How did they vote on issues relating to gender, children, environment, rights of persons with disability, etc. Such matters enhance the politics of issues and devalue the politics of vituperation. Parliamentarians and their constituencies. A question worth asking is, what do our constituents expect of us? There is also growing evidence that public opinion is divided as to the role of MPs in Ghana. These are areas that need to be seriously looked at so that we shall at all times be in tandem with the electorate. Women representation. One of the main problems facing Ghana's democratization process order. <laughs> Women representation. One of the main problems facing 
Ghana's democratization process is the role of women in politics. We all know of the gender equality provisions of the Constitution. Nevertheless, nevertheless, distinguished members of parliament. A very disturbing aspect of Ghana's parliamentary democracy is the abysmal low representation of women in parliament. There is a compelling need for comprehensive study of the factors which militate against the effective representation of women in parliament. An affirmative action law could be the only way of using the law as an instrument of social engineering and mischief correction to ensure equality. Honorable members, our democratic development is not impressive in certain ways, and in particular this way at all. The Interparliamentary Union, or the Parliamentary Union, in their latest publication, December 2012, 2016, classified nations in a descending order by the percentage of women representation in Parliament. Out of 193 nations, Ghana was number 150. And this is very sad. Rwanda was first. Bolivia second, Cuba third, Iceland fourth, Nicaragua fifth, Sweden sixth, UK, Germany, Switzerland all follow. Order. Algeria, Tunisia, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Lesotho. It is, it is worthy of note that sometimes we should not sit on our OS. Algeria, Tunisia, Zimbabwe. serious self-examination and know where we really stand in the development of democracy in the global area. Yeah. Algeria. appendix of this authoritative document which I will make available to members. to the whole. But also, to whom much is given, much is expected. And we'll expect members of this honorable house to come to a time when 
this house will be generally as full as this when we are conducting the business of this house. For which matter, I will seek your cooperation, distinguished honorable members of parliament. I thank you once again for the high trust you have beautifully reposed in me. I know that with God on our side, this session will be something to write home about. I thank you for your cooperation. So that was the, the speaker of the seventh parliament of the Republic of Ghana, Professor Aaron Mike Okwe, delivering uh, his acceptance speech. Now he is pledged to sharpen the responsibility.